welcome. And uh, I've got Nick Stanton here, and great to see you, Nick. Thanks Good for coming down. We're in Melbourne, and we're just doing this little quick uh, recording here of just what you're up to. Nick's office now, it's grown 18 years, Nick. It's amazing how time flies when you're having fun. Yep. We now have office in Sydney where we started, of course. Sydney. And we have uh, the Gold Coast, our newest office. Yes. And of course, you've been down in Melbourne now for a year or so as well. So um, we've now got the eastern states pretty well covered. So Absolutely. It's all going. Yep, and, and our intention is to, uh, Vegan, Banyan and myself, to uh, go from office to office. So sort of manning a more of a permanent base and I spread myself between the Melbourne, uh, Sydney and the Gold Coast. So mm. it's sort of a... It's a good way to you know, continually keep in touch with clients. I know in a, we're in an electronic world where we can exchange a lot of data, but a lot of time you do need to physically see the client and um, go through all the information, and especially if there's new things happening. And the clients who are doing, say, the Life Magic or Abundance courses, they have a lot of things going on, so we need to need to make sure they're right, correctly structured and going, going forward with their tax. I'm very grateful how you've been looking after this. Uh, and for those who don't know, Nick is the uh, managing partner of the whole business there. and um, his father was a uh, accountant before him, and of course, uh, came in the country there, Aubrey Rodonga, the boys returned back to the country. You can take the, the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. I've heard that a few so times. it's yes. good. And Nick, I, I am grateful for all you've done for us and all our clients. I mean, the reports we get back are always just great. And you're very fair and generous in your time, and also what you've done. And, and you're not, you know, doing silly things. You're actually giving them very, very basic and very important practical application for the tax. Absolutely. I love that letter we, you got from the tax department uh, that 95% of your clients were claiming more than That's, most other yeah. people. I think that is amazing. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just, the, the ATO sent me a letter, I think it was meant to be a scare letter, I guess, to sort of say, oh, we've noticed your practice is claiming uh, deductions more than 95% of other accounting firms in the area and of similar size. And, I think that was meant to scare me, but at the end of the day, I thought that's a nice little bit of marketing there. They're actually complimenting me that we're, we're pushing it to the absolute limit that we can, keeping under the radar with the ATO. But um, you know, at the end of the day, they, they've sort of come across and just said, "Oh well, you know, we're claiming more deductions than other accountants." So keep up the good work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. And if you're doing things structured, legally, correctly. There is no issue. It's just that the tax department doesn't take the time out to explain whether they don't ring you up and say you forgot to claim these things. And it's one of the things that Nick has taken on personally. Well, I think a lot of the accounting firms, you've got to come up with them, and apart from some very minor work-related things. Whereas in Nick's practice, they go through in that preparation of what you can claim before you even get there. And you'll have the opportunity if you are watching this, you're obviously a Life Magic client or a, a, a Abundance client, and you can have a one-on-one -on -one session, 45 minutes with Nick Vegan or one of the team. So uh, there's a lot of that preparation. Mm, so in the time we've got, Nick, why don't we talk about a few things and possibilities, and perhaps we could start with some of the structures that are available for uh, here in Australia for people yeah. to operate. All right. Uh, right. I guess as you understand, people who do Life Magic or Abundance, they come out of those seminars chock full of ideas and wanting to go ahead and they've joined alliances and, and um, struck um, you know, alliances with other people within the group mm -hmm. and they want to, you know, the five forms of income that you, you sort of um, uh, promote there and, and what is the type of structure you can do and I guess the first one you can obviously do is just do it in your own name and that's just called simply a sole, sole trader and you know a lot of people come, come to me and say oh Oh, I've set myself up in it. I've, I've got a business, I've got a new structure, and I said, what is it? Oh, I registered a business name, for example. Well, if Nick Stanton registers a business name, Nick Stanton, you viewed accountants, uh, and I earn, say, $50,000 from, from that business transaction uh, for the year, that just, just gets declared in my personal tax return as an individual, okay? So uh, it's, while it's, uh, it's not a separate legal structure, it's just, a, it's just a, uh, a, an extra section in your tax return. So if I had a wage, and I also had this extra business on the side, the two incomes get included together and mm. I get taxed accordingly. So the potential is I could still get taxed quite highly, even though I think I've registered a business name. And I think I'm gonna be able to reduce my tax by a separate structure. Uh, by the fact that it's just a sole trader, it's still me. The money mm -hmm. still goes into my return and I fully pay taxed accordingly, yep, and fully exposed. Um, the next structure or moving forward is, is a partnership. So if, um, you know, when you and I decided to, to do a business venture many, many years ago, we could have formed a partnership. We could have wandered down the bank and um, set up a joint bank account 
it's got a partnership tax file number in our joint names, bang, partnership's created, set up a business, the business earns income, and if it's a 50-50 partnership, uh, and if you don't stipulate any difference, it's implied it's 50-50, is the earnings from that partnership uh, declared in our personal tax returns each. So <clears throat> while a partnership um, the, uh, lodges a tax return, the outcome, the, the, the result of that partnership is declared in our personal ta tax returns. And a very important thing, Roy, uh, is is also you're very much on about asset protection, and I'll just touch on briefly. You know, if we if we set up a partnership, there's a thing with a partnership called joint and severally liable. Mm. And if we joined a business, and let's say we set up a business, and I did something not not correct in that business, not right, and someone decided to sue the business, and um, I didn't have, and um, yeah, if I got sued sued in that business, and or uh, well, they sued the, sued the business name. Um, and they looked at my assets, and let's say I had all my assets in my wife's name or in, in a separate structure, and they looked at my business, no assets, and they looked at me personally, no assets, and I'm the one they you dealt with face to face. But they looked at the partnership and said, oh, there's a Roy McDonald, McDonald involved in this partnership. If they looked at your personal assets and you had some assets unencumbered, they could sue you. Now you'd say, I had no idea. I, I didn't know what Nick was doing. I know we're in partnership, but I'm happy to join a bit of the share of the profits, but I didn't have the day-to-day -day running. Joint and severally liable. My actions can affect you. Even if you went, sorry, I, I didn't even help Nick run the business. I was almost a, just a passive silent, investor, yeah. silent partner. You, you're up for grabs there. So yeah. you've got to be careful, uh, especially in... in you know, I don't mind if it's um, um, husband and wife type, you know, more mm. family arrangement, that's okay. But if it's certainly... Um, a business connection, bi yeah. Business connections with separate individuals, mm. you've really got to look at look at who are, who those partners are because you, you're leaving yourself open. Very easy to open up one, but very easy to be sued for that as well. Correct. Um, I guess that leads us on to, well, how do we start to asset protect ourselves a little bit more? And the most common one is a what's called a PTY limited company. Corporation. So yeah. corporation. And um, um, the attraction of a corporation is it's taxed separately and taxed at 30%. So it's a flat rate of 30%. You earn a dollar, you pay 30%. You earn a million dollars, you pay 30%. So you know your tax outcome straight away. It's not like an individual where we've got a staggered rate of tax up to a maximum of 46.5%. Uh, you know, uh, um, with a company, once again, if we decided to go into business, we could set, establish a company. We hold one share each in that company. We're 50-50 shareholders in that company. The company makes a profit. We can declare dividends, and we can take the money out of the company by way of declaring a dividend. So I've got a bit more asset protection. Uh, a little bit of proprietary limited means there's some, some limited liability. And if we go on, go on to um, that same example with the partnership where we're running, establishing a business, let's say the, partner, uh, the company has gone into some contracts and, and we owe someone some money, some creditors some money, and the creditors decide to sue us sue us for the money at, at 30th of June, at the end of, say, a financial year, 30th of June, uh, there are no assets in the company. That is, liabilities are greater than the assets. You know, we've borrowed heavily, but we don't have, you know, we've got a lot of expenses outgoing. Now, at 30th of June, if I decide to go bang on that day, liability is greater than assets, therefore we're in a uh, deficiency situation. I come to you and say, Roy, we wind up the company with a creditor on our tail. We're a $2 paid up company. You put a dollar in, I put a dollar in. We elect to wind the company up then, liquidate the company. The creditors go for the company, and that's all they can go for. Because as directors, we've decided, look, it's no good. Uh, the company, you know, we've got we've got debts. Let's call it quits, and they can't come and claim our personal assets. But what often happens in the real world, Roy, is that um, people go, oh well, look, Roy, that was a temporary first year thing. We'll trade out of this. We'll, we'll bat on. Mm -hmm. do, do you mind signing this director's statement <laughs> that, uh, uh, as director, we can pay those debts um, uh, as they fall due? So you're almost indemnifying the company when you sign that. It's very careful if you are signing that type of director's statement, director's report, to know the ramifications for doing that. Because let's say we bat on for another year, same thing, company goes, you know, we just can't trade, we've got lots more creditors lining up. The creditors come for us again, go for the company, $2 paid our company, and there's no assets in the company. And uh, because we haven't wound the company up in that first year, they can actually then personally go for the directors. Now I, I sit around and, and I've put all my assets into a trust, so therefore they say, well, I can't attack Nick Stanton. And let's say that Roy McDonald hadn't um, put all his assets nicely structured, which I know you do, so it's a very hypothetical example here, <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, it's, um, they could go for you. Mm. Once a year, you go, well, Nick, geez, I, was, I only saw you once a year when you come around to my place for a drink and you got me to sign a director's statement and off you, off you went. You didn't realise that you were actually indemnifying the company and you could have to pay mm. the debts of that company. So just to be careful that... Um, it's not as rock solid as you may think mm. with a proprietary company. There is some some protection there, but it's not 100% rock solid. Mm. Okay, so 
So, so just no. stopping there for a yep. second, and those who are watching this, obviously Nick's not here about trying to uh, avoid things or not take responsibility in any way. And today's little session, and we meant to say this, obviously this is not uh, personal advice we're giving, it's a general discussion, general uh, overview of, of things. So each person will need their own pra uh, in, uh, particular uh, needs met on a one-on-one -on -one basis, which can be dealt with with Nick or uh, one of the planners. But having said that, uh, we at One Life, and I know Nick supports this too, that we want to be responsible for our, our debts and our things that we do, and we're a very responsible company. But what Nick's really referring to here is the different protection levels, or let's, let's call it the assumed protection mm. that you mm. think. Yeah. I think it's very wise, so you all know what's happening. And one of the things I love about the whole thing we do with Nick and the boys there is that uh, they're going to alert you to this and it is important that you are aware and although you know Nick is accountable for tax returns you're responsible and that's why he's called an accountant uh, and he's accountable you're responsible so um, it's very important to, to look at those uh, distinctions in the case of the corporation there are huge benefits there for people who want to be uh, contractors and things like that. Um, you can get your own insurance, get your own cover, you can uh, send an invoice, be paid as a contractor into a corporation, you can then pay yourself a wage out of that and, and pay the minimal tax that would be applicable and the corporation, the company, proprietary company can make the payments for the cars and the telephone and the various things that are normally tax deductible in a company. So at this level we're moving as you said, from the sole trader, ABN person, partnership, into another structure, which is, gives a little bit more flexibility. Absolutely. And from here we go to the next part, being yep. the trust. The trust. And just on that company, Roy, oh, yeah. a lot, the, one question I get asked is, because obviously people like the company because it's 30%, mm -hmm. they don't want to be taxed at 46.5%, so Correct. it's all about, with structuring, it's all about obviously asset protection, which, um, which we like, but it's also about making sure that we've got what entities are available and making sure our marginal rate of tax is the lowest possible tax. Mm. You know, it may be a choice of do we want to pay tax at 46.5% or do we want to leave it in the company at 30%? And one of the questions I get asked is, well, what's the minimum amount I need to set up a company? Now, there may be, uh, from a tax point of view, I can tell you an answer, but there's obviously some other um, aspects. aspects as well, which you've alluded to, because you, know, you could buy a car and package your car up a lot easier because your employer is not interested in giving you some salary packaging options. But uh, if you have your own company, we can package yourself. You've got the best employer in the world, haven't you? Because mm. he's going to answer yes to everything you ask him because mm. it's yourself. So you can put the wife's car in there and just be a little bit more creative and a little bit more flexible with, with some of the deductions that are claimed. Uh, but, but rule of thumb is, um, you know, you can actually pay yourself a wage now around about, it's, it's around about 160, 170,000. And that effective tax rate is 30%. Right. Some people say, well, hang on a sec, no, that, that rates, I'm at the 46%. Mm -hmm. But don't forget the first 0 to 6,000 is zero, mm -hmm. the next is 15%. So you've got to actually look at the actual tax you paid, divide it by the figure, and it gets to around about 160, 170,000. So husband, wife, 170 each, that's $340,000 before you'd even think to leave any money in the company. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's quite a high, high amount. See, that's an interesting yes. calculation. So and just to repeat what Nick said there, what he's saying is, $170,000, $340,000 between a husband and wife could well be, of that kind of magnitude, be actually a very, very clever thing as opposed to PAYG because you're, you're at 30% effective rate. Yes, that's exactly so right. So it's very clever, yeah, yeah. Well, that's really, that's you electing to say whether you pay a wage out because people say, I'll leave it in the company 30%. Yeah, yeah. I'll say, well, you pay yourself 170, you're still 30%. Amazing. Even though you think you're in the top bracket, it's just a... Yeah, it's, it's a very yeah, interesting it's number. It's a marginal rate yeah. versus that and the rate's going up because of that low income rebate and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. But I guess, yeah, moving on to the next structure, which is, I guess where my passion is with structuring is obviously the most flexible, robust structure is a discretionary trust or a family trust. They're the same thing. People come in and say, oh, I've got a family trust. They go, oh, no, I've got a discretionary trust. It's the same, same beast. And what a discretionary trust is, it's not a magical vehicle that makes tax go away. It's just a very robust, flexible vehicle where it earns income, uh, but at your discretion, at you, if you're trustee of that trust, um, you can then determine who 
pays tax on that income because the trust will earn its income. Let's say it earns $100,000, but the trust won't pay tax on that income. The trust will say, I've had beneficiaries, and these are the people who are getting distributions. And if it was husband and wife and no one else, you may say $50,000 each, but if the husband was earning $100,000 already, you would distribute the $100,000 to the wife. If you had a child who was, say, greater than 18 years of age, you might be able to distribute some income to the child as well. And it's all about making sure your marginal level rate of tax is all even across the family board. So it gives you flexibility mm. from year to year as well, so you can change those pattern of distributions. Because one of the things, you know, when you actually look at some of the numbers, people sort of say, oh, look, all that trust is, is quite expensive to set up. I might just do a partnership between the, uh, the wife who's not working and, and, and junior who's 18 going to uni, and, and they'll split their income nicely, and, and um, you know, I'll be able to get, you know, maximise some tax efficiencies there. But what happens is, um, you know, if you, this is if you had an investment portfolio, what happens is a few years down the track, the wife might decide to go back to work, the junior hopefully will be, get employed, get some and income. all of a sudden it's like, and, and you might decide to have a couple of years off. So all of a sudden you're sitting there going, oh, I don't like this income. All of a sudden all this income is going to, the, to my wife and, and my child. I want the income. Now, for you to change that investment, you actually have to sell that investment. And guess what happens when you sell an investment? There's a potential capital gain. And that goes to them at the worst possible time because they're all of a sudden earning some good income and you're not. So if you had a discretionary trust, that particular year you could decide to go, well, I'll take on the income and the wife and the child who's 18 won't get much income because they're already at a certain rate. And we really sit down and look at what income we're dealing with at the start and then we've got this other income that we can distribute and just do some you know, year-end sort of tax planning here just to make sure it's uh, sort of maximised. Then you have that sort of asset protection angle as well that... Uh, it's, it's very hard to sue a discretionary trust because the assets really are protected. If the discretionary trust does a business and, the, and, and it owns assets and, and that business does something wrong, then obviously the trust can be sued for its own assets. But if you're a person outside the trust as a trustee, uh, as an individual who has an ownership or running that trustee, your assets, aren't, um, your assets aren't up for grab. So if you own your own house in your own name, obviously, that's not up for grabs if the trust does something wrong. So what we're really on about there is that the trying to accumulate as much of your assets under a trust structure, because you're the one that's potentially going to do something wrong and be sued. So you want to try and get as much assets in the trust structure. Now, that often may mean, if you're running a business and you're owning property, having two separate trusts. Because mm -hmm. I, know, I know, Roy, as, as you have over the years, you never like to combine uh, different uh, facets of business and investment in the one trust. To give you an example, you could, it could be very easy just for simplicity to set up a trust, run your business and buy the asset within that same business. Now that business gets sued and the business hasn't got any asset because it's just you running the business and maybe a little bit of goodwill. But if a creditor is going to sue you, they're going to love to know if you've got a property in, in that trust. So they'll sue the Correct. trust. The trust has got no assets apart from this property. Bang, will go for the property. But if you've got a trust over this side and a trust over this side and that business trust falls down and, and you try and sue the business trust, you've got your property outside in a different vehicle and you've got some asset protection you can continue to hold the property and hopefully that property you know, can continue to leverage off that property as well. So that's sort of a, a discretionary trust. And I guess, Roy, we should probably touch on how throughout the years we've seen many people after these type of um, um, seminars and that that you've run is that um, they've rushed out and gone, oh, I've got to set up a trust. I've got to, that, that's what I've got to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've gone and and had uh, negatively, you know, they want to get, get into negatively gearing, negative gearing, and they've gone and bought a property, borrowed the money within the trust, and what happens is the trust will receive rental income, have interest expenses. Now, if interest is greater than rent, and that's what negative gearing is, or is interest greater than dividend returns from investment, that's negative gearing. And what happens with negative gearing is that negative gearing can be offset against other income, but if you negatively gear within a trust structure, a trust can't distribute losses, can only distribute profits. So what happens is you don't lose the losses, they just roll forward into the following year, year after year, but you're not getting the value for your money. You're paying interest, you know, you're paying $100 interest, you're getting $70 of rent, you've actually lost $30, and you can't offset that $30 against your, say, your salary income and get some of the group tax back. So the tax man's not really helping you uh, fund some of the, the, the negative it's gearing awesome. losses along the way. So you need to, so we need to look at a different structure, and that's what's called a unit trust. And a unit trust, um, operates a little bit like a company in that uh, you have a fixed entitlement. If we set up a, a, a business or investment structure and Roy holds one unit and I hold one unit, then we've got absolute 50% entitlement to that income. So the trust will make its profit and it will distribute the profits accordingly, 50% to you, 50% to me. 
Um, and as you know, which, which obviously uh, it's a very um, limited time to chat to today, we, you know, trust, I could speak a day on trust, Roy, as C you probably correct. all know, which we don't want to do tonight or this afternoon. So uh, what, what, what I want to sort of just, just allude to is don't go out and just set up a, a trust for the sake of it with borrowings. You've really got to speak to a financial advisor and accountant um, uh, with, with tax knowledge there just to make sure that you've got the right structuring in place because we've seen it done wrongly before and it's, so just, much. it's yeah. costly to unwind as well. Sure. So by now, a few of the people would be glazed over with their <laughs> eyes, Nick, yes. and uh, saying, wow. All I think is necessary here, yep. and then watching this, we'll just understand this means very, very uh, qualified to do and work, uh, sort this out and, and work through things. And it's not, he's not here today, today to try and have you become an accountant or understand all this. What really is relevant is that he's trying to probably show you as you go down that river, there's a few little rocks that you've got to be careful of and not to go over the waterfall, but to get into that ocean of abundance. And proper advice with skill, with precision, this is what these guys are up to. They're very good at what they do, and they're going to probably uh, show you ways of avoiding things that uh, cause you problems. So uh, I guess that's really all we need to know. The, 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 the thing that Nick's just saying, though, about um, the amount of times that you've had to go and what we call unscramble the egg that's been scrambled with poorly dealt with trust structures, poorly dealt with borrowings, and a lot of it's to do with, you know, a lawyer who doesn't quite understand it or an accountant or they even blame you and say, I was waiting for instructions as if you know. Um, so that's been costly for, mm, for those absolutely. clients. And it puts them in an exposed area. Circumstances can change, things can change. Uh, and what Nick really is doing is giving you a lot of flexibility as well as protection of assets and, uh, and giving you that opportunity to be able to adjust things. I think the other thing that's relevant here, Nick, and I know we've got some other things to talk about, but the other thing that's relevant here is that there's, it, it appears complicated, it's very simple when you know how, but what's relevant is that this is only for those people who are intending to be successful. Now, if you're watching this, that, that should be part of you, because there's an assumption, oh, it's all very complicated and hard and everything. The truth is your income is going to rise. You're going to be increasing your assets you're going to be an, an, and come across that, that uh, wall of fear and, and become an investor, whether it be in real estate and shares and business. And these things are relevant. Now, it's not about trying to turn you into an accountant. It's knowing where you can go to a good one. We also want to be clear that if you're happy with your accountant and they're giving this advice at this level, then that's cool. We're not here to steal anybody. But if you're at a point, and the reason we started all this, Nick, was that I was sick of hearing... I can't find an accountant that knows what mm. to do with this mm. stuff. Absolutely. So uh, that's so, so, so important. Um, I think the other issue is, is a great test when uh, you ask the accountant, um, you know, how can I protect my assets? And they talk about trusts and put your houses in trust, and, but then they'll say it's going to cost you stamp duty and legals and it's going to cost you money for the trust and then uh, you've got to re... Uh, finance it and then uh, when you sell it you're going to pay capital gains tax and you're not protected by the 50% rule and blah blah blah. What that tells me is that the accountant has limited knowledge and doesn't even know about a mortgage trust for instance mm. and how to protect an asset without going through yep. all those things. Yep. In fact how to protect your own home without having to go through the stamp duty refinancing um, how, uh, and, and not have to um, uh, pay the capital gains tax. So this is the material that Nick knows and does and uh, that's where, why you're coming to one of the top people in this area. And he's the sort of guy that will research this. And he was the guy that came up with the 500 possible tax deductions. So we're in the right area. Do you mind, Nick, uh, if we move on from the trust to yep. the super funds? Yep, sure. Uh, by, absolutely by far the biggest growth industry in Australia by an absolute mile is, is people establish, establishing their own self-managed super funds. And what we mean by that is that... Uh, you know, if you may have your money in a, in a certain uh, retail fund at the moment, you're not happy with the returns. We were talking about before how the market's taken a fair hit, you know, over, over the last couple of years, and people sort of grumble about their self-managed super. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit more about taking a bit more ownership of where you want your invested funds to go. And really, it's, at the end of the day, it's one of the most rock-solid tax-efficient structures going forward. It's not as absolutely flexible as a family trust or, or a company. But it is absolutely rock solid in from an asset protection and from a taxation point of view. Uh, 
you could ultimately pay zero tax on, on any investments in that fund down the track as well. So she's a pretty good asset, um, she's a pretty good tax vehicle if you think you're going to have asset protection and zero tax. Mm. Um, you know, there's a, there's a few boxes you have to tick to get to that level, but at the end of the day, that, that's, that's what everyone should be aiming for, mm. to have their own self-managed super, uh, have their investment portfolio in there, building, growing, and then you retire and be able to draw draw down that money. I don't know whether you want me to just discuss on how the, the government's rationale, how they could be making something at 0%. I think, that, 0 I, I think like that. that, yeah, just real okay. quick, Nick, that'd be just, great. Just a quick recap. Is what happens with the self-managed super fund is it's in accumulation mode as, 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 we're, as we're working and we've got a, a, a pool of funds and the money's going in and that's accumulating and, and you know, hopefully your super fund pot's getting bigger and bigger. And, there, and when you put money in, that super fund, when it receives, it gets taxed at 15%. But if you're on a 30% or 40% tax bracket, for example, you, put, you elect to put a little bit more super in, say an extra $10,000 worth of super, what you're saying is I'm going to save tax at 40% and the super fund when it receives the money is going to be taxed at 15%. So you're making a 25% benefit for that, for that cash flow mm. going in. And then when the money is in the super fund and invested, um, any, any ordinary earnings in, like interest or whatever are taxed at uh, 15%. Any capital gains held for more than 12 months within a self-managed super fund are taxed at 10%. That's accumulation mode. It just accumulates and accumulates. What the government is scared at is like at, at 60 years of age, let's say you've invested your money, you put a million dollars in, and it's now grown out to a, a lovely $2 million portfolio. It could be property, it could be shares, it could be anything. It could be, uh, term it could be a term deposit, whatever it is. Uh, well, let's say it's a capital gain that's grown from... Um, one mil to two mil. And you decide at 60 years of age, right, I'm retiring, I'm taking my two mil out. Absolutely, you're allowed to do that if you've retired. Grab your two mil and away you go. The cost for doing that within, within a self-managed super fund will be 10%. So it's going to cost you $100,000 to access two mil. It's not a bad, you know, it's not a bad rate. You've got to be happy with that. The ATO or the government are scared that you're going to take your two mil, you'll give some to the kids, which absolutely, that, that, that's a, a nice thing to do. But you might invest it elsewhere in your own name or whatever. And you might lose that money, or you might invest not wisely and lose all the money. What do you do then? You go to the government handout, I need to go on a pension. The government wants you to turn your accumulation super fund into what's called a pension super fund. And it's not a difficult thing to do. You just make an election that my fund is now not receiving any more money. I've got $2 million worth of, of assets there, and I'm going to live off those $2 million. And what, what the government says is when you're in pension mode, they want you to take some out. They want you to take a minimum 4% out or a maximum 10% out. You could quite nicely live off $200,000 a year drawing that out, uh, and that's tax-free, absolutely tax-free. So you've got your two mil. Any future earnings within that fund, zero tax. You don't pay any tax whatsoever because you're in pension mode. And that's the government dangling the carrot in front of you to say, don't draw all your money out, Roy. Leave it in there. Live off what you need to, uh, you know, between 4 or 10%. Or uh, live off those needs and, and, and go from there. And, and that's, that's really what a self-managed super fund is, mm. is about. It is a nice rock-solid uh, investment vehicle. And when you work at you know, complete asset protection, totally financial fortress and nil tax, it's a fairly good that's arrangement. So fantastic. they've thought it through, even though people whinge about it and stuff. One of the things that really gets me is that people, you know, it's a responsibility issue and not learning and all that. Our, our clients obviously are in very different uh, mindset and our interest in learning, our interest in working out how to do this and, and following the bouncing ball as it were. But for those who do super funds or their own self managed then give it to a fund manager, I always find that's interesting. So <laughs> whereas you just go back to the fees again, whereas what we're really wanting them to do is become an active m member of the fund and, and actively learn how to do this. And um, be a direct investor, and that's what One Life's all about. And uh, using that vehicle, then you've really got the, the, the best of both worlds. Now, I know we don't have time for this, Nick, but ju just quickly, I know there's a lot of stuff. You've got to have 100,000, you've got to have 200,000. To me, it's never about how much you have, it's how much you're going to put in mm -hmm. and where you're going. Correct. And these days, the funds are, are relatively inexpensive. The price of these things have come down so much. Even the management, if you, if you follow, follow the rules carefully, mm. you can get that, that dealt with. So uh, I think there's still a lot of scaremongering going out there with the fund managers wanting people to say it costs so much because they want to manage things. Yep. Whereas properly managed, you can really get those costs down. And again, I wouldn't be going out tomorrow and doing this. Talk to Nick, talk to the boys, get it done correctly. And uh, I'm sure you know everyone's going to have their own individual situation on that. Yep. Yep. Um, the 
We want to talk a little bit about uh, borrowings and stuff with the yeah, Superfund? Yep. Um, a few years ago, Superfunds weren't allowed to borrow, borrow money at all. And uh, for, for assets, they weren't allowed to build you know, uh, a, their base quick, uh, quicker through, through gearing. Um, the government has now allowed, allowed that in the last couple of years. It's, it's, it's really a process of, uh, you know, if you now saw, let's say you had $100,000 in, in your fund and you saw a, a $300,000 property and you decided uh, that you wanted to, you know, that was a, a great vehicle uh, to, um, to, that probably was, a, was great to be held by a self-managed super fund, is that you could go to the bank and borrow the 200000 have your 300000 go and buy that property within, within the self-managed super fund and, um, yeah, basically, have, have, you know, all of a sudden you've, you've really got a $300,000 in your fund. So, you know, mm -hmm. you, you sort of, some people, the government sort of say, oh, you need 200000 to set up a super fund. Well, this person could have $100,000 could have $100, and all of a sudden leverage themselves up to have, actually have a $300,000 growth, growth asset that potentially you could pay zero, zero on the capital gains. And any rent that's earned off that fund throughout the years are, are only taxed at 15%. And if, if for some reason interest is greater than rent and you're negatively geared within the self-managed super fund, you just put a little bit more super in to cover the shortfall, and guess what? You get a tax deduction for putting putting the money into super, don't you? Mm. As well, so you're actually covering yourself there. So it's a it's a great it's a rock solid. Vehicle. It's not as easy as it sounds. It needs to be done with with as Roy says precision. Mm -hmm. Okay, that there is a lot of um, uh, you know there's an extra what's called a bear trust. I don't like to go into too much detail. That's more for our one on ones. If you're interested, by all means, I'm happy to discuss it. But it, you know, it is means a extra little little trust put in uh, because there are some borrowing restrictions. Uh, it's got to be uh, lent at limited recourse uh, rates. Uh, so the banks charge a little. It's a little bit more expensive. You pay a slightly higher interest rate. So there are a few little little hoops to jump through. But once you once it's set up, it's almost set and forget. You have a property uh, within a super fund, a super fund bank account. Rent goes in. Rates. Repairs, interest goes out of a bank account, and it's a set and forget, simple as that. Mm. And 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 hopefully that property will grow and grow in value. And when you uh, venture into pension mode, you pay zero capital gains tax mm. when you sell that property. So uh, that's that's the way you should be doing it. Now um, we also could just talk a little bit about um, some of the benefits. Uh, Nick, you often talk in our seminars about. Um, the diamond ring, you know, or the eternity yes. ring, yep. uh, under the five percent rule. Uh, also, memorabilia. You know, you've got your Carlton football, which is not doing so well, but there you go. Oh, they're coming good this oh, year. Oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're always are. Good this year. Uh, and um, all those things, but that can all be dealt with. What it is, there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of um, choices that you have if if you're just guided with these things and. I think one of the overwhelming things, people just get overwhelmed with it, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, a session with Nick uh, can change all of that, and um, it's really so important that uh, they get prepared for that meeting and, and come together. Absolutely. And uh, yes, uh, certainly with the meetings, Roy, um, you know, it's, it's always great if, if before the meeting we get uh, you know, even an email list of questions, or even if you rock up on the day and you have your list of questions, because sometimes it's, it's your session. And happy to answer anything and you might even send your tax returns in advance or financial statements in advance or a list of questions so I sort of know which direction that meeting is going to be, mm. be heading because sometimes you know to be honest I've had some people rock up and go oh well, I'm here because Roy told me I had a 45 minute free meeting <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I really I'll, don't know what to talk about I'll have, but what, I'll have what Roy's having yeah, yeah. exactly so that's not yeah that's not preparation so it's, no yeah. it's not preparation and you know I, I'm happy to give as, as much as you ask but uh, yeah. We got to have something, you know. And I'll just, if, if you don't have much, I'll start talking on super funds and trusts and everything. <laughs> but that may not be where you're at at that no. particular second. So. And you do have a complete little list. So if you follow the bouncing ball, get prepared. Follow the yep. list that Nick is yep. going to prepare, which gives you a, just tick the box thing, and gives you some ample time to ask those questions. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and. Um, the is that all we need to talk about with that, Nick? I mean, yeah, I think, so. We could spend, I think so, Roy. Yeah. It's more just you know, if, if you do have some questions, then then our, then our follow up sessions happy to discuss any of that. Okay, and uh, maybe just we might talk about some of the um, areas that you're doing packaging in, and some of the little opportunities that yeah, you can well, see. Yeah, I guess one of the things that a lot of people says is, oh, look, I don't want to uh, set up these structures, but you know, I'm employed, and uh, um, my wife's not working, but my employer won't allow me to to, to um, you know, put her on the books or, or you know, like split my income that way, what opportunities are available there. And one of the, the, the ones that are coming out I've, I've seen in the last year or two is what's called an associate lease. And, and, and what associate lease really means is 
if you as an employee go to your employer and say, I'd like to salary package my car through work, uh, the employer will normally say, well, you go, what's called an evaded lease, you go out and pick your, you know, you go and get a, a lease through, you know, CBA or whatever, and, and we'll, we'll pay the lease across into CBA and we'll give, and, and that'll, that'll fund the car purchase for you. Uh, but it's CBA actually making the money on that. If you've got the opportunity to, you had a line of credit on your own property, you could actually go and buy that company, uh, buy that car in, in your wife's name, borrow in the wife's name, and charge, and, and what happens is you go to your employer and says, oh, I've got an evaded lease, can you send this money into this bank account, which happens to be your wife's bank account, and you're getting the salary package benefit from it uh, by reducing your tax down by, let's say, ten, fifteen thousand dollars as a normal sort of package arrangement, arrangement for a motor vehicle, but the income is going over into the wife's name, and if she's around fifteen thousand less the cost of, of the depreciation on the car, she'll get her tax down to say ten thousand taxable income. She'll pay zero tax. So you actually, in essence, moved ten to fifteen thousand of your income over to hers. Mm. If you're at forty six percent bracket and she's at zero. You've saved yourself, you know, substantial, sum. substantial amount. It's a, it's a very simple process to do. Even if you say, well, I don't have a line of credit on my property, I, I need to lease a vehicle. Well, the wife leases the vehicle, mm. okay, and she charges you a nice premium for that. So therefore, the gap, the profit, so you, it just, it, it's increased by a margin because you just tell your employer, oh, I, I, I've got a car and it needs to be paid into this account. And it's just a quick little associate lease drawn up, and, um, and away you go. So. Uh, Anyone's allowed to run a business, and that can be, and that's deemed to be a business that the wife's running a business. She doesn't have to be invoicing or keeping receipts or doing anything. So she wouldn't, you know, didn't really have to know what's going on. It's just a matter of utilising her threshold. And it particularly works if you know if you've got someone on very high income and the wife's on a very low income. Just pushing some income across. Uh, that you know, obviously those opportunities arise if you've got a discretionary trust or something in place. But if you don't have that in place, and you say, "Well, I don't really want to spend that type of money at the moment," that's a very simple, simple, simple little little kickstarter just to get used to the, the joys of salary packaging or income splitting. I just love Nick and the mastery that he does it, and this is the sort of creation that he has, and all legal, all very up yep. upfront. And you know, if, if women are listening to this, and I'm just using women as the example here because it might be a man in the Absolutely. opposite situation. Yep, I've, seen it, I've seen it done in reverse. Yeah, um, that. Fifteen thousand dollars, of which five thousand could be profit or whatever. That could be for their holiday. This could be a little plan that the wife can say, "Okay, this is going to be my holiday money for my family, and uh, we're going to plan a holiday each year. It's going to come out of this mm. company, uh, yes. this car car deal." Yeah. So, when we put a big why in there that's stronger than than anything else, and get tax benefits, and be able to do this, that that gives us the lifestyle. Because all of this, in the end of the day, is about lifestyle. It's about how you're going to live your life. How are you going to live? How are you going to love? What are you learning? What's the legacy you're going to, to leave? And, uh, and the lifestyle you're going to have. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Nick, is there anything else? I mean, um, you've got so many. Is, could, is there another little one you could sneak in there? Uh, not really. The, the only thing I was going to touch on, I guess, with all these structures is that at, at um, FMW, we, we actually create the structures. We, we instruct solicitors to set up these structures mm -hmm. on our behalf. We're not legally allowed to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. But we control the whole process, so we set up a self-management. We tell the solicitors exactly how we want them done. So if you come to us, it, it, we're a one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have Gareth and his team from a borrowing and mortgage point of view as well. Mm -hmm. that, that you know, if you're borrowing within a trust, it needs to be done exactly the right way. So we've bashed and belted Gareth around to, to know exactly the way we want <laughs> the loans to become because we've seen it you know unfold done incorrectly before yeah. we also as you know have Peter Horsfield that, from a financial planning point of view yeah. so we try and be everything under under the one roof with regard to uh, I guess investments and, and all mm. that sort of stuff and that, that goes well because you're not getting conflicting advice or mm. unsure or whatever and they work as a great team you have yep. got you you've put together a fantastic team yep. there Nick it's to your credit well I'm, I'm grateful for t for tonight and uh, for today and doing all this yep. and um, the the next step obviously is is get that preparation uh, and make a decision so that you know people can can really learn this material and, and put it into practice and yep. I know that you've got someone like Nick and the team there to be able to pass on any questions and there's never any silly questions there's only silly answers so Absolutely. it's not to feel that you've got to know all this that you've, you're in good hands. Yep. So Nick, uh, thank you so much for this. It's just, just right. wonderful, and I uh, appreciate you've taken the time. In fact, we're in Melbourne. He's come across from uh, after he took his little boy to soccer this morning. Uh, so uh, appreciate you spending this time with us. And uh, of course, we do have a 
whole hour DVD on a whole range of structural things and yep. stuff. So if they want to take that, they can get access to this too through Absolutely. our company as well. It's all part of the free support we do, our long-term commitment for this. And we also have a, a little package that, the, yes. that we'll have as well, which is the F&W, which will have all our contact details and sort of a, a PowerPoint presentation notes, which sort of goes, goes through most of the stuff that we've discussed today. It's great. So that's all available for you. Yep. So thanks, Nick. All right. Thank thanks you very much. Well done. And uh, we can follow through with this. Okay. Thank you.